Hey everyone, it's me, the least addicted Risk of Rain 2 player. Over the past few weeks, this game has become my favorite gang war simulator and has made me develop a deeply rooted hatred for Jellyfish. Risk of Rain 2 is a third-person shooter slicer bomber one-puncher builder roguelike action game about helping various alien species solve the issue of overpopulation. Throughout this journey, you will procure many useful tools to turn yourself into a god-slaying beast or the world's biggest Splatoon fan. What a cool item. Traverse different locations as one of many unique characters and fight through hordes of enemies vast enough to make Left 4 Dead look like my Tinder match list. This game poses a risk of severe addiction and presenting it to you brings me great joy because it gives me another excuse to keep playing. This video is going to be about my opinions on the game as well as how to survive in it because it does have a little bit of a learning curve and if you don't know what you're doing you might get the urge to bite your keyboard. So fasten your seatbelts crewmates because we're going on a fucking rescue mission. <laughs> Our adventure begins as we fall down to an alien planet in our escape pod, and our first instinct upon exiting it is to gun down everything in sight. Kind of like Animal Crossing fans when they see ugly people in real life. Welcome to Petrichor 5, home to many indigenous species such as Ghost Rider, Heavy Weapons Guy, and the Lizard People. Very cool that they got Mark Zuckerberg to be in this. Our objective on this planet is to find the idiots from the first game who crash landed here, probably because they didn't know about the Z-axis. So for us to traverse this world, we have to find a series of teleporters which will take us through various places such as... Uh, uh, hell, but don't worry, that, that's only in stage 4. Activating a teleporter will begin charging it and also spawn a boss you have to defeat to move on. The best advice I can give for the boss fights is to just practice social distancing. Whether it's an EMP blast, a laser beam, or the fucking heat death of the universe, you're safe as long as you're behind a wall. The only boss you don't actually need to do this for is John Lennon, just don't get swarmed by his fans and you should be fine. But before we venture any deeper, it's necessary for us to go over the most important mechanic of the game, which isn't the shooting or the movement, but simply the flow of time itself. The first thing you need to understand about Risque Rain 2 is that this is a game about time management. I say this because as time goes by in a run, enemies get beefier, hit harder, and breed faster. And as you progress through more stages, deadlier enemies will appear and difficulty will increase faster. In short, it's all about getting strong enough before the game begins to test the limits of your PC's cooling system. Are you sure these are the system requirements? The most important rule to remember for this game is don't waste time, because if you do, you will turn into a fucking wet noodle. Luckily for us, every living organism on this planet planet explodes into a pile of cash upon death, and with our hard-earned money, we can unlock chests and make purchases to acquire items of varying usefulness. But there is a catch. Do not try to loot every single thing on the map because the timer will come back to bite you in the ass. Let's say there's a chest all the way on the other side of the map from the teleporter. If you were to run all the way there after clearing the stage, the chances of you getting something that's worth all that time you're gonna take is pretty low. Worst case scenario, you could roll some completely useless shit like, uh, the Chinese fireworks. In which case, the game will just proceed to fuck you even harder. You would have been much better off just moving on to the next stage and looting there instead. Take what you can get as efficiently and quickly as possible. You do not have to be a speedrunner to beat this game. All you have to do is become a devout Buddhist, achieve nirvana, and transcend the mortal plane so that you are no longer held back by material desires. It's that easy. The decisions you make throughout the run will ultimately determine your chances of victory, but don't be afraid to make mistakes because with experience comes wisdom. But all that being said, this is still a shooting game, and if you are unable to perform the discharging of the firearms at an adequate proficiency, you're in for a bad time. Which is why we now need to discuss the many interesting individuals we may assume control of and how to use them effectively. In O'Driscoll Train 2, we may play as one of many trained combatants, each with their own set of abilities and playstyles. And if humans are too boring for you, there's also a jelly dog and a cyborg cabbage. Starting off with the more simple characters, we have the Commando, a DPS machine that fires bullets more often than he breathes air. The Huntress, a mid-range jack-of-all-trades who wields the power of King Shark. The Bandit, a sneaky man who specializes in assassinating his enemies from behind. His passive may be called Backstab, but I personally prefer using bullets. And Multi, who as his name implies, is a multi 
multifaceted alien disintegration machine, offering a wide variety of tools for turning your enemies into a red paste, and has the unique mechanic of being able to switch between two primary weapons. Moving on to the slightly more complex characters, the engineer is a defensive and strategic man who relies on his robot slaves to do his bidding. Just be careful not to fall off a cliff because the jetpack is purely cosmetic. The artificer is a mage who burns and shocks people but most notably turns them into ice cubes, instantly shaving off a third of enemies' health bars, including the final boss of the game. The captain is a tactical genius who decimates enemies with airstrikes and is also a hacker man, capable of opening any container completely free of charge. And Rex is a sentient cabbage bot who shoots people with marijuana, sacrificing his own health to do big damage. Gotta bring Pyra and Mithra to the fucking weed plantation. <laughs> and finally, we are left with the more personal characters. The mercenary is a character for VTuber enjoyers and places emphasis on skill and mobility to carve enemies into tiny sashimi slices. He's pretty hard to play. The loader is a girl boss who gaslights her opponents with her massive fists and is also Spider-Man. And last but not least, Acrid is our friendly neighborhood Mongolian war dog who fell into a nuclear reactor. And when he isn't using his radioactive dog water to engage in chemical warfare, he is personally packaging aliens into dog food. That is a lot of characters, but thankfully, most of them are actually pretty straightforward. But if you truly want to get good, there is some tech in the game for you to learn. Kind of like the famous video game Super Smashy Brothers Melee. Most notably, every attack that can be charged allows you to hit sprint while charging it. You pretty much always want to do this, not just because you probably don't find it fun to move at the pace of a garden snail, but mainly because the enemies really like it when you do. And in the case of Acrid, sprinting allows you to cancel the animation of his melee attack, which for the people without arthritis in the audience means that your attack speed is exponentially higher. If you want another example, Multi can cancel the reload animation of his weapon when he switches it. So if you equip the rebar puncher on both his weapon slots, you can fire it at a rate that is probably much higher than what the developers intended. As long as you keep these things in mind, you will be able to play pretty much every character well. The only special one is the loader, whose charge gauntlet scales with how fast she's moving, meaning that running at enemies and punching them normally is what I would do if I was fucking stupid. Instead, go ahead and charge up a giant fist and grapple yourself towards the entity you would like to delete from the game. Congratulations, you have successfully turned this creature's face inside out. But knowing how to play your character is only the first step to becoming a pro gamer, so let's talk about items. The drops in this game can be roughly classified into three categories, which are damage, mobility, and life support. A good rule of thumb to follow is that damage should always be the highest priority. This is because by the time you reach stages 4 and 5, the game begins spawning in one-shot salamanders and the fucking bronzongs that kill you instantly. If you can't eliminate these threats quickly, your run will feel like a pillow fight except that your opponents have fucking knives and heavy artillery. Basically, if you aren't killing things fast enough, try to fix that before it's too late. Much like people, different items are more suited for certain characters. For instance, the commando and the engineer's turrets are fucking pitching machines that vomit out bullets non-stop. As such, items with on-hit effects are very strong strong on them simply because they hit people a lot. Yeah, I think he might be bleeding, you know, just, just a little bit. As for the other two categories, the priority of an item is much more character dependent. For example, the bus in fungus is normally terrible because before you can start hitting that yoinky spoinky, it requires you to cosplay as a fucking American in Tokyo. But for the engineer, and only the engineer, this becomes one of the best items in the game because his turrets are able to bus it down sexual style, making them goaded with the sauce. <laughs> Immobile characters like the captain are also unable to break their own claws, so the hapu feather is is pretty much a must-have, especially when you get fucking up smashed by the magma worm. I've always liked Super Smash Brothers, my favorite thing about playing it is I could have friends. Mobility is usually just good to have on most other characters, also because it's easier to navigate the fucking Mario Kart stage the developers put in by accident. I could go on about the many other examples and tell you about why it's optimal to build cock rings on all the female characters in the game, but I have a dog to take care of. Just know that despite the game's genre, it does still offer some freedom of choice when it comes to items, so be smart about what you pick. So now that we've spent the past 8 minutes going over my declassified school survival guide, you're pretty much ready to take on stages 1 to 5, which means it's time to talk about the true challenge that lies ahead. You could say that it's absolute lunacy. So after completing the five stages of grief, we are given the choice to align the final teleporter to either the moon or the planet. Piss of Pain 2 is somewhat special in the sense that there are two ways for you to complete a run. Normally, you'd head over to the moon to escape the planet, but for the more mentally stable individuals, you may also choose to continue your never-ending quest to eradicate all life until you decide to obliterate yourself from existence. More on that later. By taking the primordial teleporter to the moon, we enter the final level of the game, which comes with the free limited edition brown gamer chair. Like, because you'll shit yourself. Well, 
Welcome everyone to Commencement, featuring you versus the entire task force of Tian Armour. Instead of activating a teleporter, our task here is to find a way to turn off the shield around this spaceship so that we can get the hell out of here. We do this by deactivating four pillars around the map which do not go down faster when you jump on them, but that's not stopping me. Just watch out for the fucking gaster blasters that'll gun you down instantly. But even after accomplishing this, we find that the shield still hasn't been turned off, so perhaps this non-threatening looking portal may be of assistance. I am Mithrix, king of nothing. The, the king of nothing? Which is what you are about to become. What is up guys, here I am fighting the final boss of the game. If you guys think this is crazy, leave a like on the video. <laughs> As per his friendly introduction, this is Mithrix who, according to the lore, was imprisoned on the moon by his brother because he threw worms into a singularity. I guess some crimes just can't be forgiven. Even with a good build, your main win condition here is to just not choke. Because more than anything, this fight is a skill check. I guess you could say he's the snow of hammerhead sharks. If he isn't running at you at mock speed, firing missiles, he is busy trying to integrate your face into the pavement with his hammer. And the only thing more painful than getting hit by him is the realization that there's a second phase, which is these fucking guys again. The one piece of good news I have is that this part is actually pretty manageable, because once you understand basic projectile motion, picking them off one by one becomes a relatively simple task. But if you thought we were done, well, think again because Majima Construction is back. This is where you find out that the first phase was actually a warm-up to teach you his moveset, and I hope you're a good visual learner because it does not get any easier. You up in a meat grinder, and the only thing that comes out like left of you is your eyeball. <laughs> You're probably dead! You might recall that we're supposed to be on a rescue mission, which you would be correct about, but if there's anyone that needs saving at this point, it's me. Let's take a step back and rewind all the way back to stage 5. Instead of going to the moon, we're gonna go ahead and align the teleporter back to the planet. Welcome to the next loop. Past this point, the game transitions into a very good CPU stress tester. So remember that teleporter boss? Yeah, he's a normal enemy now. The real teleporter bosses have 700,000 health. My shots do 400 damage. While defeating Mithrix is definitely an experience, you'll eventually realize that looping is the objectively more fun choice. Because unlike commencement, returning to the planet allows you to pick up even more items to further your ascension to godhood, which, by the way, is mandatory if you choose this path. Ironically, if you can understand what's happening on the screen from now on, you're probably not going to survive. And yes, you can loop more than once, although that might not always be a good idea. But when you've had enough violence for one day, the developers put in a celestial portal which allows you to obliterate yourself, effectively completing your run without having to clear commencement, because I think they realize that this is probably comparable to fighting Mithrix. Hey, uh, I heard you play Final Fantasy XIV. Yeah, I do actually, why? Yeah, I think you should try the new expansion. I think it was called uh, Grass Toucher, or, or was it Bitch Getter? While we're on the topic of looping, there are many reasons to keep playing, even after you beat the game. For almost every character, the alternate abilities of those characters, and a good number of extra items, there is a unique challenge to unlock them. God damn it, I unlocked the fucking squid paw. Not to mention the game's selection of lunar items, which exists for the express purpose of comedy at the expense of fucking up your entire run. Oh wait, they're, they're so screwed. Wait, uh, uh. <laughs> Just be careful you don't fall off outside the shop or you might end up in the null void. For people who shower more than once a week, the game also has a pretty seamless co-op experience which allows for up to 4 players. It's really fun, kind of like Borderlands for people who don't hate themselves. And I haven't even talked about all the difficulty modes and the artifacts you can unlock to modify the rules of the game because, well, I'm lazy. But just in case you still haven't had enough, there's even a DLC and an entire library of mods you can install to add even more content. Commando, I need your help to stop the modding community, they're making my ass too big. Despite my minor addiction to it, the game still has some areas for improvement. The base number of items isn't quite as high as you'd hope, the teleporter bosses aren't super interesting, and some of the challenges to unlock stuff are kind of overtuned, but the game absolutely delivers when it comes to what matters most. As in, the gameplay of the video game makes me feel the big fun. If you asked me about the game in 2019 back when it was in early access, I probably wouldn't even have remembered that I owned it. It definitely took a while to get to where it is now, but this is one of the the best co-op experiences I've had in a while and it's incredibly refreshing to find a game like this that I genuinely can't put down. Hello, hello. 
this is the end of the video and I am very tired so I probably sound like shit but I hope you found this at least a little bit entertaining and if you did your like or share or comment or subscription would be greatly appreciated. I'd also like to properly thank Bumbles, McFumbles and La Rubric for being incredibly nice and shouting me out. They also make gaming content similar to mine so if you like my stuff you should probably check them out. Also a special thanks to my friends that appeared in this video. Uh, I'll probably put some credits on the screen like last time. As usual thank you for taking the time to watch my video. I know I probably sound like dog shit but I really mean it <laughs> until we see each other again.